So today we will um, be starting a new chapter um, on uh, precipitation hardening. <coughs> in steels. So those of you who've ever taken a uh, introductory uh, mechanical uh, metallurgy or material science class on uh, mechanical properties of materials will know that that is a very common way uh, used to um, harden uh, alloys and, uh, and and steel is al is also um, we also use precipitation hardening in steel. Um, in fact, in in all types of steels, we apply the method to uh, to increase strength. In um, steels in general, with the um, carbon steels, the uh, most um, uh, famous uh, application is high strength low alloy steels, although there uh, we have to say that the the amount of strengthening you get from the precipitation is not that large, uh, mainly because we have very low levels, low volume fractions of um, precipitates. The, um, the reason why the HSLS, HSLA st steels are um, strong is a combination of both uh, grain refinement and precipitation hardening. Uh, the other um, uh, steels that are precipitation hardened are uh, typically uh, special steels. Um, stainless steels in particular, right? So we will talk a little bit about different classes of steels, different types of steel, like martensitic stainless steels and austenitic stainless steel, ferritic stainless steels that are um, precipitation hardened. So a little bit of a departure from the types of steels we've been discussing up to now, all right? So in general, if you want to uh, picture yourself uh, what is happening during the uh, precipitation strengthening. So imagine a single crystal or a grain inside steel and we apply externally a certain force F, yes? And we have here a screw dislocation propagating from right to left, right to left, and um, we have, by certain by a certain trick of microstructure control, we've managed to get particles embedded in the lattice. Yes, and um, and the dislocation meets these uh, particles on its way uh, through the lattice mm, and interacts with these particles. Mm. And in general, you can say that there are two mechanisms, hmm? if the particles are very large or if they are very hard, and they can in that case be very small, yeah? uh, then we have a process which is called bypassing. The dislocations do not go through the particle but bypass the particle. Hmm? And in the process of doing so, as they bypass the particle, they leave behind a dislocation loop around the precipitate, yes? And every time a, a new dislocation passes through, it leaves an, another dislocation loop around the precipitate. Okay, so that's one thing that can happen. Another thing that can happen is that we have small particles that are soft or, yes, um, the screw dislocation passes now and it, can, it cuts through the, um, through the particle. Hmm? And um, in order to do that, uh, there needs to be some kind of 
coherency between the, that particle and the, uh, the matrix so that the, the slip can be transferred through the, the particle. So high level of coherency will be required to manage, to be able to cut the particle, yes? Uh, so, and then if we go back now a step to this uh, bypassing mechanism, yes, uh, lack of um, coherency between the particle and the, uh, the matrix can also be a, a, a way to uh, force dislocations to bypass the particle. So we, we have basically two extremes to these pictures, large or hard or incoherent particles or particles that are all, all these things at the same time. Or we can have small, soft, coherent particles that, that can be uh, sheared um, as the dislocation pass. Okay, and um, the, you know, steels are very complex, so precipitates occur often. The precipitates that will impact the, the strength, yes, uh, via uh, cutting or bypassing, have necessarily to be in the lattice. So if you precipitate something in a grain boundary, you know, grain boundary is by itself a, uh, an obstacle having the precipitate in the grain boundary doesn't help, right? So it's important if you want to achieve uh, uh, solid solution, uh, excuse me, precipitation strengthening, the particle needs to be in the lattice, yes? So some examples, first of all, up there in the corner, uh, vanadium carbide is an example of a precipitate in a high strength low alloy steel. You, so you can see uh, a ferrite grain clearly, and then the particles, the vanadium carbide particles embedded in the, uh, in the grain. Hmm? A very common uh, precipitates in, in steel is, is, the, is carbide, it's the is, is cementite. Hmm? And so that particular image is of a martensite uh, lath, which contains uh, small precipitates of um, uh, cementite. And you can see um, uh, indirectly that the cementite is um, coherent with the ferrite lattice because it's got this needle shape and you can see the needles are either at this specific somewhere uh, 70 or 80 degree angle or horizontal, right? So that tells you there is a high degree of coherency. You know, there, there's going to be a lattice correspondence um, uh, orientation relationship between the cementite and the um, um, matrix. Example here of a um, other precipitate uh, that we see in high strength low alloy steels. These are carbides and nitrides of niobium and titanium. And another way uh, to uh, precipitation harden um, ferrite is by copper additions. And we'll talk about this a little bit uh, more in depth today. And you can see here, this is a micrograph. You can see all these uh, 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 dots here are basically copper precipitates. Again, inside, you can see the grain here, grain boundaries here, yes. You can see it's inside the grain. Hmm? That's a necessary condition for the um, precipitation hardening. Hmm? So when you look at this, uh, what, what can you see? Well, obviously, there's going to be 
very important parameters to precipitation strengthening. Uh, obviously, the properties of the, the particles, you know, whether they're hard or, or soft. And for instance, uh, uh, copper is definitely a, a much softer phase than ferrite. Uh, these nitrites are extremely hard, yes, in comparison to ferrite. Uh, so, very different behavior. Uh, so, that's one thing, the, the properties of the precipitates. Second, the volume fraction, uh, you can see here, volume fraction of my copper here is much larger than the volume fraction I have there of my vanadium carbide, you know, volume fraction. And, and this is even higher density, the, uh, the carbide in the Martin site. Uh, and, <coughs> and, and then, uh, obviously, the size of these particles. You know? The uh, uh, cementite particles are... Um, um, let me see which one. Yeah, the, the, I think in this case, the actually the, these carbides here are the, are the smallest uh, of of the of these examples. So the size of the particle will have an influence. And of course, as always in uh, dislocation strengthening mechanism, yes, the um, if you have an obstacle. You remember the, the condition for breakaway from an obstacle yes, is that the externally applied stress yes, is proportional to a critical uh, breakaway angle yes, and 1 over L, and L being the distance between the obstacles. Yes? So the uh, density the radius, size of the particles, and the inter-particle uh, spacing uh, are important parameters. Yeah. Now, one of the things you have to realize is that the radius, the density, the inter-particle spacing, and even the structure of these precipitates is not, these are not single numbers. This very much depends on how you engineer the microstructure. So, and they take for instance a, a very nice example of precipitation hardening in steel uh, is when you add a few percent of copper to ferrite, yes? Uh, so this is work is recently done at uh, at GIFT here, and um, it shows what happens when you precipitate copper, when you form copper hmm, in the ferrite matrix. Yeah? So originally, the copper, which is in supersaturation, so you you basically form it from a supersaturated solution. Well, we'll won't go too much into the microstructure, the way you achieve the microstructure, but I'll say a few words about this as uh, probably later on today. So you start making very tiny particles, which are more clusters of uh, copper atoms. And these clusters, you know, um, copper is FCC metal. Well, in this case, it's actually a BCC uh, um, precipitate, basically. And it's, it's, it's an alloy. It does contain iron, yes, but it's definitely BCC, yes? And obviously, that's not the natural state of copper, yes? And it will evolve to FCC, pure FCC copper particles. But it will do this in steps, yes? In steps where you make a special structure, crystal structure, which is called 9R, yes, which is orthorhombic, in which is still iron copper alloy. And you can see the microstructure uh, up here, the uh, high, um, um, the, the, the lattice, um, uh, high resolution TEM uh, lattice image up there, which is a magnification of this small particle, 
yes, small particles, about five nanometers at this uh, stage. So it's, it has grown from a tiny cluster to a larger uh, particle. And then this thing will continues to grow, yes, and there is again a, a crystal structure change, yes, to FCC copper. Yeah? All the while, the iron atoms are expelled from the lattice, from that, the lattice of this growing particle, and you get nicely twins, you can see the twins in these particles. And eventually the particle becomes larger, yeah? it coarsens. If you wait long enough, the particle will, uh, you will have uh, ripening processes. The particles become very larger, very much larger, at the expense of smaller particles. So you, and, and you end up with FCC copper, and it's basically pure copper particles. Mm -hmm. So depending on how far I've carried out the aging, at what temperature I've, gone, I've done the aging, I will get different particles, different types of particles. Okay, so, and that will impact the um, precipitation strengthening. So that's an important, if you were ever involved in uh, research in this area, n never forget this. You know, it's, it's not because you do one heat treatment that you have to get a single uh, radius composition distribution and interparticle spacing uh, for your precipitates. Hmm? So it evolves a little bit more work, and we'll, we'll discuss this. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, so and also, so again, uh, right. um, let, let us now have a look at the precipitates. And to connect with the previous slide, let's look at the crystallography of these precipitates. We have um, when we try to engineer precipitation hardening in a in a, in a grain inside a grain. Yes, we always have to make sure that there is some crystallographic relation possible between the precipitate and the matrix. Hmm? And so, uh, just to highlight the similarity between the matrix, which can be uh, BCC iron or FCC uh, gamma iron, yes, I show here on this slide the, uh, the, the matrix um, crystallography and then the crystallography of the main um, types of precipitates that we see for steels. So take, for instance, a BCC iron, so uh, alpha uh, iron. Crystal structure it goes, also goes by the name A2, right? Well, one of the precipitates that you can use for precipitation is the B2 structure or cesium chloride, the same as cesium chloride. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, and uh, that's the structure of FeL or nickel aluminum, yes? And you can see it's basically very similar to BCC iron, except that the central atom is now replaced by a, another atom, aluminum, yes? So you can have iron aluminum, you can also have nickel aluminum by adding nickel and aluminum to uh, your iron in a certain way. We'll, we'll talk about details in a moment. And then we have the important DO3 structure, the important DO3 structure. And if you look carefully, and I've tried to visualize this as best as I could in uh, this uh, crystal chart, you can see that it's nothing else than a combination of the A2 structure and the B2 structure. You can see, you see the four A2 blocks and four B2 blocks. You can see these uh, cesium chloride unit cells or the B, and 
the normal BCC unit cell. And that's the big unit cell. Yeah. Um, DO3, and a, a very uh, important representative of the DO3 uh, structure is iron-3 aluminum. Yes? So don't mix iron-3 aluminum with nickel-3 aluminum. They have nothing in common, all right? Okay, iron-3 aluminum. Um, then we can also go one step further hmm, and complicate the structure of DO3 one more step by having the four units, the four unit cells that in the DO3, yes, which still looked like A2, yes, we now in the center, we put another atom. Hmm? For instance, uh, on the dark atoms, titanium, the lighter atom, silicon, and I get a structure which is called the L21 structure, yes? And in steels, uh, you can have the L21 structure uh, with precipitates Fe, titanium, silicon. Just to I some faces, I'm not sure if everybody gets it. So, okay, so you see this unit cell here, right? So you've, you've got it here once, and here once, and here in the back, and here in the front, right? So the, these three are B2 units, and then the other units are one, two, three, and four here are eight A2 units. So that makes the DO3. And now if I have basically uh, two different unit cells, one of them, and there are two B2, uh, so this is a combination of A2 plus B2, yeah? and this is a combination of two types of B2s together. Right, and, and so one atom would be silicon and the other atom would be titanium, all right? Okay. So you can see that simply by uh, uh, making the lattice a little bit more complex, uh, having larger unit cells, I can make um, structures that will pretty much be able to match crystallographically the, the, their matrix without too much lattice strain, okay? So that's for BCC. For FCC, so our starting structure is again a, uh, the, 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 the basic unit cell for FCC gamma iron, that's A1 here, okay? I can do the same thing as what I did here. I can uh, have a, 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 a crystal structure, for instance, titanium aluminum, T-I-A-L, Yes. When I replace the atoms on the horizontal, um, on the mid horizontal uh, plane here, by aluminum, and then the other uh, 10 atoms are titanium, mm -hmm. then I get um, TiAl. Mm -hmm. One step further, so that, that's would be the equivalent, once the first nickel-3 aluminum, yes, I get this by having all the atoms on the six side planes to be um, aluminum. Hmm? Oh, sorry, nickel in this case, because you have one, three, so you have, you, you can see the formula, you have uh, six atoms divided by two, so you have three nickels, and you have eight atoms divided by eight, you have one aluminum atom, okay? Um, and then we can also have carbides, yes? And carbides have um, also uh, a basic structure, very similar, if you look at this, very similar to gamma iron, yes? Except that in between the main atoms, Yes, I put in, yes, 
interstitially, as it were, it's not, really, it's not an interstitial, but if I put carbon atoms here interstitially, I would make the structure of the, the carbides. And all the carbides look like this. Okay. And, and, uh, and we can form carbides not only in, in, in FCC, but also in, in, in um, ferrite, in BCC iron. Okay. But you can see the connection between these common precipitates in uh, BCC and FCC uh, steels. Um, and, uh, and, and that's really the reason why you can precipitate them in the lattice. Because there's going to be some lattice strain, but the lattice strain is not that large. So you, you can, you can uh, precipitate them in the lattice rather than in the grain boundaries. Yes? When the, the mismatch is very high, you will get precipitation in grain boundaries, and that's not, that's not what you want, basically. All right. Okay. Right, so let's, um, let's just start asking ourselves, is there, is there a simple way to re relate volume fraction of precipitates, their radius, yes, and the the distance between the particles, the, the mean distance between the particles. You know, that's a very useful thing to have, uh, re this kind of relation, yes? And um, so this a nice derivation, and then I'll, I'll also add a correction to the formula. Uh, but it's a very nice derivation and because um, uh, certainly when you're involved in experiments, yes, you may have, you may know what the volume fraction it will be of precipitate just by calculation. Yeah, you know um, how much, for instance, niobium you've added, how much carbon you've added, so you can calculate what the volume fraction of niobium carbide will be. Yes, uh, you can also, from, for instance, TM analysis, get to know uh, the radius of the particles. Yeah? So if you if you know these two things, then you can calculate the third thing, yeah? the, the mean uh, inter-particle distance. Yeah? And if you know the inter mean inter-particle distance, you, can, you have a way to determine the strengthening effect that you, that you are trying to achieve or that you have achieved. Okay, so, so a relation between the volume fraction of precipitates the mean precipitation size and the average spacing between the precipitates. So what we do, uh, very simple, you, you consider a thin slab of the grain, yes? And this, that slab has a, has a thickness of the mean grain diameter, right? 2RP. So it's, it's a slab that's as thick as the mean particle diameter, precipitate diameter, and it's got a surface area of A, which not, we don't necessarily need to specify this. So the whole volume, yeah, the whole volume is 2R times A, right? 2R times A. And if I multiply this with the volume fraction of precipitates, it gives me the volume of precipitate. Hmm? In, that, in that slab. And this, the, the volume of precipitate in the slab is 2RPA times F. Hmm? So uh, once we have this, we're in business. Hmm? So this is the volume fraction of the, the volume of precipitates. Hmm? So then I can calculate the number of precipitates in this slab. Yeah? Hmm? And it's very simple. I have the, uh, well, I'm, I basically, it's a little bit upside down here. I have the, uh, the uh, dimensions of the, um, the precipitates, uh, which I assume to be circular, uh, four-thirds pi r to the, rp to the third divided by the, the volume of precipitates. I sh this should be uh, one over, uh, actually. So I'll, I'll uh, correct this. 
when I uh, put it on the on the e on E class. Okay, so anyway, this is the the answer. And I can uh, determine the aerial density of particles. Yes, so that is uh, the number. Yes, this is correct here. This is the number of uh, precipitates. Yes, divided by a. Yes, that gives me how many precipitates I have per unit area. Yes. Okay. Now. If I assume, yes, if, so, so the, the aerial density tells me how much, yeah, basically how much of the area I assign to one precipitate. Yeah? So this is, one precipitate on this for this for this area right so that's the aerial density of course if i know the aerial density one over that uh, uh, the aerial density and the square root from that gives me the interparticle spacing hmm? okay and that's this is what i do here the average distance between the particles is 1 over the square root aerial density, and it's this. Okay, this is an important formula that, uh, as I said, connects the average distance between particles, which is an essential feature here, yes, with the uh, radius of the particles and the volume fraction of the particles. Okay, so now we can go on. First of all, by making a correction to this formula. The, if you ever use this uh, formula in practice for HSLA steel, just go ahead, it's fine formula because we have very low precipitate fractions. Yes, but if you're using, if you're studying precipitation-hardened uh, steels, which are not of the HSLA type, yes, the volume fractions are much larger in this case, much larger than in the case of HSLA steels. Then, then you better use a, um, an up, uh, a better approximation for the uh, interparticle distance. Hmm? Uh, and that is because this uh, uh, the formula up here uh, overestimates the uh, the particle spacing. So I'm, I'm not going to prove this. Uh, this is the equation. Yeah. Um, it's actually you can see that the original equation is in there. Yes, uh, and and the correction is very simple. It's just numerical. Uh, values, so it's it's you can as well use this formula. So so what what do I so if uh, so so the way it, it looks like is that uh, I think I should. Have Volume fraction, yeah. So if the volume fraction is is larger than 0.1, yes, then um, the top formula overestimates the distance. Yeah. So you you need to have to use the corrected formula. Yeah. For HSLA steels, yes, our volume fractions are of the order of 10 to the minus three, right? So it well within the area where this, the, the formula on top is, uh, applies. So, so you can use that formula. In other cases, particularly precipitation hardened uh, stainless steels, etc., you, sh you should uh, perhaps use uh, 
uh, this formula. And, and here I give an example. When F is large, that's the case, for instance, for precipitation-hardened austenitic steels. Um, this is a, a very uh, common uh, grade, A286. Yeah? Uh, this is a better approximation. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at this formula first. Just, just simply look at the formula, yes? Uh, and, and not, uh, let's not think too many, uh, uh, consider many uh, practical considerations. So let's, um, so let's plot L as a function of the radius of the precipitates, yes? Okay, at constant volume fraction, right? So you, when, when you change, when you have a constant volume fraction, and you change the radius, yeah, um, the particles become larger, but you also have fewer particles, right? You cannot have the particles all becoming larger. You so, so you're basically discussing coarsening, right? Okay, so you have small particles to start with, yes, and these particles become larger at constant volume fraction, so I get less particles, all right? So, okay. so what happens to the distance between these particles? Yeah. It, gets, it gets larger, okay? Okay, now, uh, right, so let's look at the, let's look at the, well, let's, the top one is, is uh, um, for a certain volume fraction. So here we have L values are large, and as I increase the radius, the particles become larger. I get less particles, obviously, and you can see that uh, the distance inter particle becomes larger. Hmm? Uh, and if we increase the volume fraction, so here I have, a, I have a larger volume fraction, obviously I have twice as many particles, automatically the distance becomes smaller, yes? And again, if I coarsen the particles, yes, at same volume fraction, at this higher volume fraction, I get an increase of the interparticle spacing. The problem is that when you are uh, what well, not the problem is, but when you do actually do a precipitation hardening treatment, yes, both these parameters change. Yes, at the beginning you have no precipitates, yes, and then you precipitate, yes, you precipitate particles. And at the beginning, you have nucleation phenomena, and after that you have growth phenomena, usually diffusion-controlled growth, and then eventually you get coarsening phenomena. Yeah? So, so nucleation, you have little particles, yes? Tiny particles, far apart, yes? And the particles grow, yes? Yes? Eventually, of course, you do your precipitation treatment at a single temperature, yes? So eventually you reach the equilibrium volume fraction, yes? So the volume fraction of particles increase, but as, as you, uh, uh, your aging time runs, your volume fraction will saturate, yes, particles will keep on coarsening, yes, the, their radius continues to increase. So obviously the distance between these particles, yes, well let's, let's see what happens, yes, is it a simple function of time or not? Well obviously because of the way F changes and R changes, yes? So for instance, if, uh, 
let's avoid zero because zero is not, not such a nice, uh, yeah. But here at the beginning, I have tiny particles. Our P is very, very small, yes? And F is increasing, right? F is increasing. So I've got small particles, F is increasing, and L is R, small, divided by something that's increasing. So L is decreasing. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so that's one thing. Let's look at, lo at long times now, where the particles are coarsening. Yes? In this case, F has reached its saturation. Yes? F doesn't change anymore. So F is constant. And the only thing that happens to L is it increases because the radius increases. So here L, um, L goes down with time and here L goes up with time. So it's clear that there's going to be a soft point, yes, where L is minimum. Yes? Where we reach a dip and then we, the coarsening causes L to increase again. And again, so what's, why is that so important for the mechanics? Well, because L is in the denominator. So when L is small, yes, this will really reach its highest value, right? So this spot here where L is minimum is very important, yes? And, and it will correspond to the situation at which we call peak aging, peak aging. That's where you get the maximum strengthening. And again, uh, it's a function of time. And, and why is it a function of time? Because the volume fraction and RP are a function of time. Okay. Right, so now let's have a look at um, some, some real situations. Uh, so precipitation strengthening models. It's kind of interesting when you look at, so again, I remind you, you have two situations. You have the precipitate cutting, can be cut, or the precipitate can be um, bypassed. Hmm? When you cut a precipitate, there's many things can happen, yeah, depending on the dislocations, the matrix dislocations, the dislocations in the precipitate, the crystallography of the precipitate, you name it. It's complex. Yes? Um, one of the things that's really important is that the strengthening when you cut particles is proportional to the square root of volume fraction times diameter of particle, yes? And there are a number of strengthening mechanisms. We'll discuss some of them and some of them will calculate examples, yes? You can have strengthening due to coherency. You can have strengthening due to what, what's called chemical hardening, order hardening, stacking fault hardening, and modulus hardening, yes? So these are different ways in which precipitates cause hardening. In the case of a particle, the properties of the particle themselves are unimportant. The dislocations just don't go through them. So it's very simple, actually. Yeah. There's only one mechanism. Yeah. So in this case, uh, so we have hard, large particles. We cannot be sheared. So the, the, the properties of dislocations in, or faults in uh, the precipitates are irrelevant. And in this case, the strengthening is proportional to square root of F and R divided by RP. So, so we have uh, so the cutting mechanism. And the other one is the bypassing mechanism. And, and here we have square root F times RP, and here we have square root F divided by RP. So you can, you can see that the fundamentally different mechanism. In this case, 
it's good to have larger particles, yes? In this case, it's bad to have large particles, yes? In both cases, it's good to have a high volume fraction of particles, yes? So, so here, this, this is always good. I have a high volume fraction of precipitate particles. Okay, so let's now discuss an example of, um, of precipitate cutting. Yes. And we'll talk about modulus hardening. And we'll derive the formula uh, which describes the, uh, the hardening. Yeah. Well, the word already says it. Why would, what is this strengthening due to? It's due to a difference in elastic modulus, uh, in shear modulus, in Young's modulus, etc. Uh, between the matrix and the precipitate. Yeah? And the formula will derive, tells, gives us delta tau, yes, that's the strengthening effect from uh, a uh, precipitate, which has a different modulus from the matrix, is 0.8g times p divided by L, and then the square root of 1 minus the ratio of precipitate Young's modulus divided by the matrix Young's modulus square. So if you look at this formula, you can already see something very interesting. First of all, if EP, the precipitate modulus, is equal to EM, there's no hardening. Okay, that's obvious. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, if EP is zero, yes, which means a void, there's nothing there, yes, uh, the hardening will have a maximum value, yes? So it, it gives you some kind of, uh, it gives you something, a hardening that's a little bit counterintuitive. It basically means that when a particle is soft, I get hardening. And when it's softer from an elastic point of view, I will get hardening. So when um, yeah. so, so what I basically have, the way you have to think about it, is this location passes through the precipitate, yes? I have different um, uh, um, uh, shear modulus in both phases, yes? And so the dislocation properties will be different in the particle, yes? That's, that's basically... Uh, what modulus uh, hardening is all about. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, uh, what, what we're trying to do is, is what you always try to do when you are uh, considering uh, strengthening mechanisms, yes, is you, um, you basically look at this graph. So, this is just a review of something we discussed earlier, right? You look at the dislocation, which is held up at these obstacles. And in this case, these obstacles are not solute atoms, but they are precipitates, yes? And again, the precipitate exert a, they withhold the dislocations from moving, yes? And this is balanced, yeah? This force is balanced by the line tension of the dislocation. And we know that uh, if, if this angle, this angle here is uh, phi over two, yes, and this angle is phi, yes, we, we, we basically have F is two times T, two times the line tension times cosine phi over two, yes. So that's a fundamental equation, yes. This can be rewritten you know, in terms of the geometry. In, in, if, if you, if you, um, you can use phi over two or theta over two here. Yeah, it's the same, and you get then 
two t sinus t to over two. Okay. So now w the other thing we know is that um, uh, this the situation is caused by an externally applied stress. Yes. Otherwise, the dislocation would just be standing straight minding their own business and not running into these obstacles, right? So the, the force on the dislocation which causes this situation to happen is B times, uh, tau times B times the length of the dislocation segment. Hmm? So it's tau times B and if the dislocation segment has a radius R, yes, yeah, and, the, and the distance between the particles is L, mm -hmm. then we know we can write tau B times L, tau B times L as tau B times 2R sinus theta over 2. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. So now if, if I combine this and this, yes, I get this. Right? So tau times B is F over L. Hmm? F is this here, yes, the, the force of the particle, yes, and L is the distance between these particles. All right. Okay. All right. right, so um, we will now in the, uh, uh, apply this to copper, in iron. Copper in iron, uh, the, uh, we know from uh, analysis of the, the strengthening mechanism that this is a modulus hardening uh, mechanism. Yes? Uh, so um, we look at, uh, so cutting of precipitate, copper precipitate, which is softer than the matrix softer in terms of modulus and um, and we look at the, the precipitate uh, strengthening that, that results. So, so basically we have the same as what we just looked at on the slide, a line, this location line, a counter randomly dispersed copper particles and they have a mean distance L. Yeah? We apply an, an externally, an external um, stress, yeah, which gives us a shear stress on the glide plane, yes, and the dislocations bow between the uh, neighboring precipitates, and, and they have a curved shape with a certain radius r. Hmm? And then what we get is we get a balance, hmm? Hmm? whereby the precipitate exerts a dragging force on the dislocation, and that's balanced by the line tension, and so we can write, that's what we just saw, F is 2T times sine uh, phi. Right, I should, this should be phi over, no, I, yeah, there's a little bit of confusion here, I think. Right, this is, this phi over 2 is, is phi, I sh I, I, okay. I'll, I'll make sure this, uh, so in, in terms of the, what you're going to see uh, in the next slide, this angle here is not called phi over 2. This, this angle is called phi. Okay? So I'll, I'll, I'll correct this. Um, so 2t sine phi, uh, where t is a, uh, the line tension, and we know we can write it by gb squared over 2, yes. We, we also know that this, this is not perfectly correct you know, because it will depend on whether we are looking at the screw dislocation or edge dislocation, but we'll, we'll just use this uh, for the time being. Okay, and when I have breakaway, yes, um, that's when this angle reaches a critical value equal to t to c, the phi c, 2t phi c. And if I uh, substitute 
the formula for t in here, I get this equation. So f max is g b squared cosine phi c. So what I want to say is that so I have a situation that goes from this to a situation that goes from this. Yes? So as I increase the tau, yeah, tau is increased, you go from here to here. Yes? The, the t vectors always stay the same, right? Remember, the only thing that changes is their sum becomes larger as the bending uh, um, uh, between the, uh, or the advance of the dislocation between the two pinning point increases, right? So, uh, in other words, this angle here, uh, theta c, uh, sorry, theta decreases, yes? So you can see here it's, it's this value. At every time f is equal to t, 2t uh, cosine phi, yes? Yes, but you can see that as the angle decreases, yes, the cosine goes up, yes, and and I reach a steadily higher f. When I reach f max, yes, which defines the obstacle strength, yes, I also reach a critical angle, and the dislocation passes the obstacle. Okay, so that's well known from earlier. Uh, okay, so. Um, so, of course, this is, this force hmm, is, you can also relate it to this, the, the situation can also relate it to the externally applied force, which, so this F max is then tau, the strengthening, times B times L is equal to this F max. Hmm. So I can, I can determine that strengthening is equal to GB over L times cosine of the critical angle, okay? All right. So, how do, how do I uh, look at this in terms of the, so the, so the critical angle is basically what defines the, the obstacle strength, right? Because T is, is always the same for all my dislocations. So what defines the obstacle strength is this critical angle. So now I, I'm going to look at precipitates. The shear modulus of the precipitate is shear modulus GP. The shear modulus of the matrix is GM. And so we have different line tensions in the matrix, TM, and in the precipitate. The precipitate should be... And so the, uh, very simply put, the, the uh, line tension in the precipitate is alpha G P times B square. And in the uh, matrix, it's alpha G M times B square, where alpha is one half, yes? And now we, you can express the force equilibrium at the matrix precipitate interface. And I'll, I'll show you how this is done. But it basically, this, this force equilibrium states that the uh, Tp times sinus theta p is equal to Tm times sinus theta. We'll see this in a moment, what it means. Yes, this is how it works. The, let me go one slide further. Yes, so the dislocation uh, is first outside the particle, yes, and it moves into it. As it moves into it, hmm, the dislocation assumes, so this shape outside the uh, particle, yes, and inside the particles it makes a straight line, yes, and then the same situation on the outside. So, um, and if 
you look inside and outside, excuse me, outside and inside the particle, I have different, yes, different line tensions. Okay? Okay? okay you can see here. And I also have different, the, the different angles here. Uh, these, the angle theta p here is the angle that the dislocation makes with the, um, uh, the normal to the interface here. Yes? And theta m is the angle uh, that the external um, uh, line tension makes with the uh, normal to the particle here. Okay? Now what's important here is that as the line, this dislocation line, moves through this, uh, the particle, eventually, say very close to breakaway, yes, this angle here, yes, you see when this point moves to this to this here, yes, so close to breakaway, this angle here goes to 90 degrees, yes, yes, At, so as I approach breakaway, breakaway being the dislocation comes out of the particle, this angle theta p prime is, uh, is close to 90 degrees. And Theta m here, yes, again, as, as this, this line basically moves up to here, yes, theta m and theta c move towards each other, yes. It's because this, the normal to the, uh, the surface moves upward here, right? So when they meet, yes, theta c and uh, theta m become clo move closer to each other. Huh? At breakaway, hmm? at breakaway, that's when the dislocation, this dislocation goes out of the, uh, you see it, it, it uh, when it goes out, it has a small, uh, dislocation line segment. So at breakaway, it comes out, and so that's where this these this holds. Yeah? Okay. But another thing that's important here: the force equilibrium at the matrix interface yields that is expressing the fact that the uh, the this, the components of the uh, line tension in this, in this direction here yeah, should be equal. So theta m times sinus of theta, uh, tm times sinus of theta m should be equal to theta, uh, tp times sinus theta p. Yeah. So, yeah, so if the angle is large, tp should be small, and if the angle is small, Tm so, uh, should be large. Hmm? So that's, you see there is a difference in Tm and Tp, yes? And that causes this difference in Tm and uh, theta m and theta p. And these two components of T, the, the small arrows here, should be equal and opposite. And that is expressing, that because I need to express force equilibrium at the uh, interface. Okay, so now if I ex use this, I express equilibrium at this, this equilibrium, and I express this equilibrium at breakaway conditions. So that's where theta p is, goes to 90 degrees, yes? And theta m reaches the critical angle for breakaway, I get this. Theta p is equal to theta m times sinus critical angle. Okay, so this is the same in three steps. Okay, and now it's, it's very simple. 
I use the equation, the fact that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1, and the fact that uh, there is a simple relation between the uh, shear modulus and the Young's modulus and the shear modulus. Yes, namely that the shear modulus is the Young's modulus divided by 2 minus 1, 2 times 1 minus the Poisson ratio. So if I combine these two things with, oops, with the equation I just had here. Right, so I, I need to use sinus, I have, need to have sinus critical angle. Okay. Right, so this is the critical angle. That's square root 1 minus sinus square of the critical angle, and it ends up being this simple equation. GB divided by L times the square root of 1 minus the square of the ratio of the particle modulus over the matrix modulus. And uh, so this is the basic theory. There is a more refined theory, assuming random array of precipitates. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and it basically gives me a slightly lower value for delta theta. And I can plot this, yes? If you plot the... Uh, in delta theta, the only important factor is this here. So if you plot this square root uh, parameter as a function of the ratio of EP over EM going from 0 to 1, yes, you find that um, it goes from 1 for a void to 0 when matrix and precipitate parameters are the same. And I can determine what the modulus ratio is for copper and iron, yes, it's about 0.6, so that means that um, um, this parameter will be uh, close to 1, about 0.8, close to a very high value. And I can also, um, using uh, the formulas we just uh, discussed, determine what the breakaway, this breakaway angle looks like. Hmm? So say if we have a, a particle that has a, um, very, a, a modulus that's very similar to that of iron, yes, then the angle here, the breakaway angle before the dislocation breaks away will be this angle here, will be very close to 180 degrees, yes? So that's what you get. If EP is equal to AM, the breakaway angle is close to, yes? On the contrary, if uh, this, is, this is a void, yes? So basically EP is zero, then the angle before you have breakaway becomes this angle here becomes very small, hmm? it goes close to zero, and that's what you see here. Hmm? And so what's the breakaway angle that you'll have, or you should see for, um, so th this angle here, you should see uh, for a ratio of particle modulus over matrix modulus, that's 0 0.62, yes? Uh, yeah, equal to 0.62, you can see it should be uh, between 60 and 80 degrees, so a little bit less than 80 degrees, about 70 degrees. That should be the breakaway angle. All right. So let's see what we get um, in the last few minutes uh, in practice for iron copper. So you make measurements. Uh, and you, uh, you extract from your measurement 
the strengthening effect due to precipitations. So first thing you have to do yes, is remove the effect of copper solid solution because it so happens that when you add copper for precipitation hardening you also have copper in solution so you have copper precipitates and some of the copper remains in solution so the copper that remains in solution has a solid solution hardening effect yeah? so for instance if you add 2% mass percent of copper you can see you have an increase in about 75 megapascal okay so always uh, very careful when you add alloying elements yes and you're trying to evaluate how much strengthening you get from precipitation strengthening make sure that you also take into account the fact that that element may in solution also cause uh, solid solution hardening right so so in this case uh, you must uh, uh, remove the, the solid solution hardening due to copper so let's have a look at the uh, data so oh yeah first of all how, how does it how do you do this in practice well it's very simple this is a or oh, the principle is simple this is the iron copper phase diagram yes it's the iron rich part of it so here we have a few percents goes to up to three and a half mass percent of copper so let's say we have three percent of copper we fully so the first step is we solution treat the alloy so in this case it means just going to gamma phase region so solubility uh, uh, at the solution temperature is high okay so yes. all the copper is in solution then the, f the thing you do is you quench it you quench it to room temperature yes and so the solubility at the uh, at, at this temperature is very low so so when we age the material we reheat it to 500 degrees C you can see the solubility is very low yes copper will precipitate first nucleate and uh, uh, form clusters then the clusters will grow and you'll get this uh, structural change also so you can look at the precipitation sequence as a function of time yes so you can look at the precipitate radius as a function of aging time so you can see it here particles are coarsening yes you can also see the precipitate spacing how this precipitate spacing changes with time so here I had particles that go from 5 nanometers 15 nanometers you can see how much time it takes to get 5 nanometers uh, about 28 minutes for th is 3000 seconds yes the precipitation spacing increases goes from about 50 nanometers to uh, 250 as the uh, aging proceeds yes um, the and it depends on the composition also you can see here that at one mass percent I, I stick at around 300 uh, nanometers yes and if I look at the hardness I see uh, that for two for, sorry, for one uh, mass percent the peak aging is relatively weak yes relatively weak and occurs at around 10,000 seconds yes and the peak aging for two mass percent is occurs earlier at around uh, I would say here that's uh, 200 between two and 300 seconds yes so a few minutes that's where I have the peak aging so why don't I see this the precipitate spacing changing 
Well, that's because where these measurements start, yes, I'm already past the peak aging. Yes, I'm already past the peak. I'm already, uh, this, this is data for two mass percent. I'm already past the peak aging, and we're looking at what's called overaging, and the particles are basically coarsening. Yes? Okay, I, c I can do something similar, yeah, but instead of having in the x axis the um, precipitate, the, the aging time, I can have the um, precipitate radius. I, I'm seeing I'm over time here. I'll, uh, we'll, we'll just continue on, uh, on Thursday uh, because uh, it would take me too long. Anyway, thank you for your attention, and uh, we'll see each other on, on Thursday to continue.